So it's the last week of August and we're here in southern Appalachia where I live and today I'm going to walk you around and show you my garden. I've been doing these garden tours during the summer so you can go back and check out the other ones and kind of see the progression of the garden. Well in late summer like this in the area of Appalachia that I live in, the garden is kind of petering out as we would say. Things are drying up, things are kind of dying out, it's getting closer and closer to the fall even though this is the last week in August and we still have quite a bit of time left before before frost arrives, still those plants that were planted in early uh, May and uh, late April, those plants are kind of run their course and beginning to die out. We do still have things producing in the garden though. We're still getting beans and we're still getting tomatoes, our okra, our peppers, different things. But it's funny how some years certain things do really good in the garden and then other years they don't. Last year was like a bumper year for cucumbers and tomatoes for us. This year has been the best year ever for winter squash. I've grown the biggest pumpkins that I've ever grown. My Cushaws, what we call a cushaw, I'll show them to you in, as we go about the yard, they've done better than ever before. So it's funny how some years um, are good for one kind of vegetable or two or three and then the next year not so good. This year I've had tomatoes but they've not been as good as usual and my cucumbers have not been good at all because they got attacked by powdery mildew. Our winter squash has really done good this year. I think it's the best year ever that I've had for pumpkins and for uh, cushaws and candy roasters and things like that. So I'll show you some of them. One of them you can see, there's a, there's a terraced bed here above me on the bank and it has, it's our blackberry bed, but I also put two little pumpkin seeds in there at the beginning of the year and they've produced and kind of uh, went all over the place up on the bank. But you can see one of them. It's come down the bank and kind of there's a sweet gum tree here and it's took over the sweet gum tree and then if you look down under the where it's pulling the tree down you can see one of the pumpkins. So that's a Chambers Creek pumpkin. That's one of my favorite varieties to grow. A friend, Don Cassida, gave me the seeds years ago and I keep them. Typically that's about the size they get. This year I have some in another area of the garden that got really big. I just can't even believe I've never grown a pumpkin that big so I've been excited about those. So my rattlesnake beans that I had right here on this little trellis, they are still producing. They are doing so good. And the plants, all they, they have a little bit of Japanese beetle damage, but not very much. They're still, I mean, I just can't believe how good they've done. And I can't wait to grow them. I'll be growing rattlesnake beans from now on. So on the other end, beside the rattlesnake beans, that's just a little small area that we have. This is the turkey crawl beans that someone sent me. And they are doing really good too. And they produce really a big bean. Um, it's, it, it took a long time, it seems like, for them to come on. But once they did, they've really been a good producer too. So I've enjoyed growing them this year. And then on the end of the trellis here we have one called a goose bean that a, re that a viewer sent was so kind to send me and they are finally producing so I'm excited about them. So this is the arch that we had the cucumbers on and I've just went ahead and pulled them out and disposed of them because they had that powdery mildew. We still have some tommy toes on each end growing these yellow sun gold which are really good. This is a little one that uh, just kind of reseeded itself from last year. It's called Matt's Cherry. It's very good. It's just really tiny, but very good, very tasty. I'm hoping to plant, I went ahead and pulled that stuff out because I'm hoping to plant some of my fall stuff here. I typically plant kale, but I'm tempted to try to plant some more beans or something, or cucumbers. I don't know. But I've, this is just, like I said, the end of August, so typically our first frost, some years it might be in October, but some years our frost, our first frost won't even be till November. So I've got some time to play with. So my peppers always seem to come on slow. It just seems like it takes them forever, but then once they do, it just, they just, they love this hot, humid weather, whereas other stuff by the end of the summer is kind of saying, okay, enough's enough, I can't take it anymore. So you can see we're getting a lot of peppers. And they're doing really good and they will go all the way until that frost they will i'll have peppers until the frost just the first hard frost of the fall of the year i'll just come out and they'll all be laying over so i just let them go till then 
So this is my Juliet tomatoes, and they've not done as well as I would have hoped, but they, I still have got tomatoes from them, and I want to plant them again next year and see if they do better next year. But we're still getting them, and you can kind of see there's a lot of new growth up here on the top, so we'll just leave those and let them continue to produce whatever amount that they produce. So this time of the year, this late season, this is one of the prettiest areas of the garden. You can see I'm in this arch that is just completely covered by Malabar spinach. I just love the stuff too. And it's so pretty and it's beginning to put out its little little tiny flower-like things, which makes it pretty too. But it's just, it's just one of the plants that I'm so glad that I tried last year. I've just so loved it. And this is just such a pretty area. I'd like to bring a chair and sit right here and just enjoy. Yesterday I was sitting out here enjoying. I wasn't sitting right here though. I should have come and sat right here. I was sitting out on further in the woods eating a popsicle while Katie played the fiddle. And that was very nice. So this is our two rows of Cherokee purple tomatoes. And we've been eating them, and they're so good. They're our favorites. But they've not done as good as they usually do. I think part of it is that wet weather we had early on, those two weeks of, like, really wet with no sunshine. But also they've been suffering some bug damage from some little, little tiny, teensy white um, critters. And I've put diatomaceous earth on them, but I definitely need to do them again. And I almost pulled them out the other day when I was out here working. But then I thought, there's so many green ones that I still own them that I just couldn't bear it. So I left them. But I definitely need to, to hit them again with the diatomaceous earth. So these are grow bags that we had down through here. And I have already pulled up some of the tomatoes. The tomatoes we had in them were the Nebraska Wedding and a green one that Katie got. Both of those, she got me the seeds for Christmas. I did not care for neither one, so we won't plant those again unless we had to, unless we, you know, <laughs> needed them. I'll, I'll still save the seeds. But I, I've already pulled some of those up. My favorite part is still being these beautiful zenas. They are so pretty, and I want to make sure that I do this again next year. I'll use some of these grow bags, I think, this fall when I start planting my fall stuff. I love to plant extra kale. Uh, we love it. I eat it every day in a salad during the winter. And usually where I live, kale will overwinter very well. So I do that. And I like to plant extra, though, because who else loves it? My chickens. And I love to be able to give them something fresh and green in the wintertime, you know, when, the, uh, when there's no grass to pull for them or no refuge from the garden leftovers for them to have. So I, I think I'll plant, and I like to plant it back here where they're at, so that makes it easy. When I come out to feed the chickens, I can grab two or three handfuls of kale or, or spinach, lettuce, whatever it is, depending on the time of the year, and they really enjoy that. So in the last garden tour video, I talked about the lychee tomato, the one that I'd tried, you know, this first time I've ever grown it. And you can see the, the sharp spikes and all that. And I said, it's, it's sweet, but it's kind of flavorless and I'll never grow it again. Well, I think I just didn't wait long enough. So now that I've actually waited until when the little petals do really pull back away from it and the fruit is just sitting there for the picking, they actually are pretty good. They're really good. So even though I said that I wouldn't grow it again now I'm already thinking that maybe what would one plant hurt you know this was two plants and you can see how big it is I'm the only one that eats it though there's nobody else nobody else even wants to try it but every time I come out to the garden or come to get the chickens or come feed the chickens or come get eggs I stop and have a few and now it's kind of grown on me so I think I might grow it again next year I've changed my tune I guess about the lychee tomato so down here in the lower part of the garden, uh, things are doing better probably than the, the beds up there. I feel like are kind of like on their way out more than the ones down here. The tomatoes here, right through here, are still producing. Uh, not as good as they usually do, but they still are. Just beyond me, right over there, I have some peas. They're still producing. And another little part of, uh, another few plants of rattlesnake beans that are still doing good. We have lost a few tomato plants right through here, and where we've lost them, I come back and planted some rattlesnake beans. So I have some, right here's one that's made it all the way to right there, started climbing, and then I have about three or four on that side that started climbing. Uh, the tomatoes behind me, our mountain princess didn't do good this year, and then I planted this weird variety that I'll never plant again. Matt's like, go back to what we like. I'm like, I know, but I love trying all the different kinds. Anyway, but the, my favorite tomatoes this year of all the ones that we've had, and I think in the earlier video, I said that these down here were also sun golds. They are not sun golds. So they're these little orange ones, um, little tiny orange ones, and 
they are the best tomato that I have ever tasted in my life, hands down, all of them. Now, I don't know what they're called. A friend, uh, Carolyn and David Anderson, and I have a wonderful interview with them if you've never seen it before. I'll link to that so you can see it. But last, like in September maybe, I went to their house to interview them. And as I, they had these growing as that you walk up to their house by their garage and I got one and eat it because of course I knew they wouldn't care. And Carolyn seen me eating them. So she went and picked them, picked me a whole little thing and sent them home with me. So they are so good. I just can't believe it. And I think in another video I misspoke and said they were sun gold too, but they're not. They're just this tiny little orange tomato. I'll have to ask Carolyn and David, I'm sure some of you will want to know where they got the seed. And it may be one, uh, they've been gardening for their whole life, so it may be one that they've just had and maybe handed down in their family. I'm not sure, but it is the best tomato ever. Mm. You just can't even explain how good it is. They are so good. I also have some of the Matt's Cherry that's volunteering down here, too. I have some of those. And they're really good, too. They're just so teeny tiny that I decided not to plant them again this year. But I didn't need to because they volunteered everywhere. Someone, when I said that in another video, said they're perfect, that they dry them, that they like them dried. So that's an option you could do. And they're really good to eat. It's just that somehow it seems harder to fool with the little tiny ones than the larger ones. But that's probably just me. So down here in this part of the garden in front of the beans is where I have my okra. And I have like, I can never remember, it's granddaddy something, a green one. And then Jing orange, that's my favorite to grow. Um, and then back in here in the back, I replanted some squash, but they're not really doing that good. They've been planted probably three weeks and they're just still tiny. So maybe they'll, maybe I'll get a squash or two off of them, but it's not looking good. So an interesting thing about okra, Pap and Granny grew it. They love it uh, my whole life. So I helped with it, helped plant it, helped harvest it, all that. And Pap taught me that as your okra grows up, that you take off, like, so you can see right here where I've cut some of the okra and took it in to eat it. We've already been eating fried okra, one of the great things to eat, right? So after that, you would, the, the leaves below that, you would pull them off. So you can see by the end, you can see on this one over here too. So by the end of the summer, when these just keep growing tall and tall and tall, they look, they're just like skinny little poles and then on the top is where the okra and the blooms and all that is. Now I've seen other people in my area do that, farmers down the road. So I just wonder, is that a Appalachian thing or did anyone ever teach you to do okra like that? So the thought behind it is what Pat told me, and of course someone had taught him to do that, is that because as you trim and prune it, kind of like how you do tomatoes, then as the plant goes upward, it produces more. It, it will produce more okra. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. Maybe this is just like an Appalachian thing, but that's what the way I do my okra. So by the end of the season, as they grow up and I've, I've trimmed them off, they'll just be really tall, skinny poles and all the foliage and the okra and the blooms will be on the very top. So these are our two long rows of greasy back beans. We've been, um, usually I pick about once a week. You can see I'm, I'm due to pick right now. And then we can beans, and we, of course we eat some of them fresh. So we've been doing that. And these, these beans have been producing good for us, kind of like they usually do. Green beans are kind of one of those easy things to grow, at least in my experience. And they were one of the staples for people in Appalachia in days gone by when you had to worry about uh, putting up food for the winter, whether you were canning them, pickling them, or making leather britches, dried green beans. And still today, I would say many Appalachians, that's part of their main diet is beans, whether it's green beans or kind of soup beans, dried beans, but still green beans make up a lot of our diet. Granny was telling me, of course, we plant her a little garden, but it's nothing like the one that her and Pap had in days gone by. She used to have like a contest with herself. She would, every year she would try to can more green beans. She can't, she's not really able to do that, but she has, she told me the other day, she said, I have managed to can 51 cans of green beans and that way I look at it I'll have one can for w per week for the next year so that's how she was looking at it which was sweet um, I think if you've seen the crochet video she says that Pap told her and it's the truth the two things she's most crazy about is green beans and crochet so I'm standing in our squash, winter squash, watermelon jungle. It's been a jungle. It's beginning to die down. You can see before this, it was kind of like a sea of these big leaves uh, with stuff twining around inside them, but it's beginning to die back. 
but you can see right here one of the pumpkins that I was talking about. That's the, like the largest pumpkin I have ever grown. You can see it's a beaut it's gonna be a great one. Just behind it, there are two big candy roasters. I love candy roasters. I have a video about those too if you don't know what a candy roaster is. Just behind the candy roaster, you can see uh, butternut squash. Just above, uh, on the other side of this pumpkin, there's a butternut squash. Last year, my butternut squash may have maybe got that big. They were the teeniest things you've ever seen, so that's really great. And then another kushal. That's a small one. That looks big, but that is a small one. I probably have like, I don't know, six or seven. I'm going to share them with Granny, of course, and we'll, we'll enjoy putting them up. I love to eat them uh, roasted in the oven. They make good pies and other things too, but I love to just chop them up and um, put olive oil and salt and pepper and, and whatever kind of your favorite seasoning is and roast them. I love them that way. So over here outside the garden, it's kind of dying back, the squash and the watermelon and all that is, but it's kind of like then they've, they've decided to come out into the driveway. So you can see down in here, while those others are almost ready, here was, there's a pumpkin that's still green. You just kind of have to find in the weeds. Here's the little orange one, isn't that one pretty? That may be either a Seminole or a sugar, sugar pumpkin, sugar pie pumpkin. And even some little watermelons, that one will probably never make it. But so far, it's, my, it's there. I do have some sugar babies in here that are about ready to eat. One of my favorite things about living in Appalachia are the distinct seasons. So while it's kind of bittersweet that parts of the garden are dying back, there's always that hope of the next season. So I'm hopeful about the fall garden. I can't wait to, you know, I was excited. I was kind of sad when I tore out all the tomatoes and cleaned out those beds in the back of the house. But then I was too excited. I was thinking, oh, well, is this where I'm going to put my kale this year? Should I try to do some another uh, row of beans here and see if they make before cold weather arrives? So there's always that excitement. Um, as the gardener, you know, I kind of, in one way, especially putting up and doing the hard work, there's almost a rest, like you get to rest in the winter a little bit, but it, it, from the garden, from the chores and all that. And, but even then, I'll already be thinking about, well, next year, I'm going to give the Juliet tomatoes a try again. The Nebraska wedding and stuff, I'm never growing that again. I'm going to go back to my Arkansas Traveler, like Matt said I should have grown this year for the tomatoes. Each season offers a time for reflection. I like to think of myself as living close to the land. Of course, I'm not doing it like my ancestor did, but I still like to take time to notice the trees. You know, they're, they're in their full uh, summer garment glory right now. They've just got those beautiful summer garments on. In the fall, they're gonna have their beautiful fall garments. You know, they're red and they're oranges and they're yellows. And, but in the winter, when there's no leaves on them, they're still beautiful. There's a beautiful starkness about them. So I just like all those different aspects of those changing seasons and I'm thankful that I get to live in Appalachia where I experience each of them. So I hope you enjoyed walking around in the garden with me this morning. Please leave a comment and tell me about if you're a gardener, how's your garden doing this last week in August? Is it almost played out like mine or is it still going strong? As always, I hope you'll continue to drop back by with me and celebrate Appalachia.